ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಮಂತ್ಸ್ ಲೆಗ್ ಡ್ಯಾಮ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ವಿತ್ ಅಸ್ ಟುಡೇ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಸುಮಿತ್ರ ರಂಗನಾಥನ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಆನ್ ಗಾಡ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ಪದ ಆಸ್ ವರ್ಷಿಪ್ ಇನ್ ಬೆಟೆಯ ಕರಾಣ ದ್ರುಪದ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬೆಟೆಯ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಬಿಹಾರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಶಿ ಇಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಟು ಅಸ್ ಸೊ ಫಾರ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬಿನ್ ಲಿಸಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕರ್ನಾಟಿಕ್ ಮ್ಯೂಸಿಕ್ now she is going to talk about hindustani music with drupad over to dr sumitra ranganathan thank you namaskaram to everybody um, thank you very much to the tyaga brahmagana sabha for this opportunity i am going to begin uh, with a song and at this point i have to make a disclaimer this is a lecture demonstration the lecture part is going to come from me all the demonstration is with the people who would be on stage usually with me the musicians of the betia garana fortunately for me i have a lot of recordings to share with you so the pleasure of listening is entirely ours today <laughs> today is gods in place pada as worship in betia gharana drupad you know number of people when i sent uh, you know uh, the invitation out they were very puzzled by the first three words so i thought let me start really uh, by telling you why i picked this phrase gods in place and hopefully at the at the end when you you know when we finish i will come back to this theme to really um, emphasize what i mean here by the word place and what has that to go, got to do with the practice of music so before we begin the other words which may or may not be familiar to you i see in fact some of my guru bhai and bains in the bains in the audience so they can also you know contribute you know especially during q and a drupal it is a compositional form it's a medieval genre um it is uh, came came into being around the 14th century consolidated around the 15th century typically sung in four parts and the four parts are v- almost identical in structure to the pallavi anupallavi charanam structure even though that is three so this is four this stai antara sanchari and abog a number of early composers you would have all heard of swami haridas tansen baiju bavra if you have not seen the movie it is now you know about nayak baiju's name i've listed you know from the 14th century the repertoire of drupad has been accumulating and um, 
17th, 18th centuries, it was still one of the most um, strongest compositional forms and genre of performance for Hindustani music. In 19th century, it gave way in terms of performance to the khayal, which a number of you may be more familiar with for common listening. But at the same time, Drupad did not vanish. It was actually the genre of choice for composers in the Bihar, UP, Bengal regions. So, in fact, the court of Betia, the compositional activity really was very dominant at the same time the Trinity was composing. So, late 18th, early 19th, all the way up to the, you know, the latter half of the 19th century was when the Padas of Betia were written. And um, I'm not going to go too much into the genre. Usually you'd have a lot alap in the way it's presented uh, by, uh, by most performers today. You have a long alap and then you'll have a short composition followed by rhythmic inf improvisation. But the point I want to make here is with the Betia Gharana, although performers do sing alap, the pada, which is the equivalent of the kriti, is extremely important to the performance. The experience of the performance itself, the aesthetics, everything is carried by the compositional form. Um, I'm not going to go too much into performance format. I welcome questions. Uh, not just at the end, you can actually uh, stop me at any point and ask questions. Now, today in this talk, you know, I've given you this uh, from the 14th century onwards, 700 years uh, of history on this slide. The interesting thing is the Betia Gharana's repertoire has a representation from every century in, in this, starting from Swami Haridas all the way to 20th century composers. There are compositions. But for today, I'm going to focus primarily on the 19th century because that is when composition happened in Betia. And uh, the question I'm going to ask is, how did this happen or what were some of the, the things that catalyzed this creativity in Betia at that time? And there is where I will bring place in. Um, towards the end of the talk though, I will take you back to the idea of circulation and how the early centuries matter. So, we'll start, you know, I mean many of you, how many, anyone here been to Betia? I hope somebody will go. I myself haven't been back for more than a decade now. Um, let's just see what Betia looks like. Uh, this was So, I actually, I, the entrance you see, uh, Betia is a town and uh, it's a, quite a major town in the Champaran district and uh, the entrance you see is to this village of Bhanu Chapra and Bhanu Chapra is one of the places where hereditary musicians live. So, you see the cyclist going, if you make a right there, that is what I would call Main Street Betia. So, now so many of the, uh, you know, the hereditary families and now there is only one family of musicians singing there and that to one expert practitioner. And he has stayed there, but at one time, this place was alive with music. And alive not with, even today you see, hear a lot of music there. But it was alive with the sound of Drupad and Drupad of the kind that you heard. The song I started with, Bhavani Dayani. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the person whose name we associate most with this song is Begum Parveen Sultana. You, she, people do not allow her to stop her concert without singing this song. So it has become very popular as a khayal bandish and many others have also sung it. It was actually composed in 19th century Betia 
and it was a composition of Maharaj Anand Kishore Singh. The musician you heard, I will play a much longer clip by him shortly, was Pandit Inder Kishore Mishra, who comes from the hereditary families, one of the Malik families in Betia, and it was in the context of a class. So it was just a casual recording done at home in a place which did not have electricity or running water when I was doing my field work. Things should be much, much better now. So just in terms of location, and this is kind of important, um, you'll see that uh, Betia is located a little south of, the, of Nepal. So it is on a very old walking route through, you know, all the way uh, you'd go up to Nepal and uh, the history of Betia is very connected with the history of Nepal, with Banaras, Reva. There is a whole circuit which is important to our story. So when I talk about place, it is not just this little town. You know, you saw the town. Contemporary Betia, uh, when you go there, you just can't imagine that music like this came out of there because there is nothing there that will actually tell you this until you walk into Pandit Indra Kishwar Mishra's house. Suppose you had not met him, right? There is no way you will even think that such music came out of a place like Betia. So that takes me really to what I have made the sort of central point of my talk. And this is how it's going to flow. The question I'm asking here is, how do places, what do they, how do they matter to creativity today? You know, in those days and how later on we'll talk about today, we all know that, you know, technology is such a big factor in our lives. We also travel a lot, you know, hardly anyone stays, uh, you know, even where their uh, family is anymore. We travel and technology have made the world a very, very different place. But if we have to ask ourselves what do places bring to creative processes, and in this case, it's a very important question because today, as I said, Bethia is very isolated. Nobody goes there from anywhere. There is no travel tourism, there are no listeners, there are no patrons. So how do musicians there still keep singing? Is there something there in place that sustains this music? And how do we, sitting far, far away, how, when we listen to this music, how do we listen? So this is what I would like to do. So in my own research work, I am a researcher, which should by now be very obvious, uh, that uh, I, I was able to piece together a number of the histories and the musicians are very important to this. My own uh, primary guru is Pandit Falguni Mitra. I'll come to his lineage later. He is from the Betia Banaras tradition. It's a Betia Gharana lineage. Uh, and so the question I'm asking here is, let us try together to imagine the soundscapes in which the, this creativity happened in Betia. And there, today I've chosen to focus on the Pada and on worship. The, uh, there, is, there are reasons for this which will become evident. So the question I'm asking is, what is the connection between Betia, the place? Is it just Betia? Is there some other notion of place that is there in Betia? What about the, the deities? You saw the Murti of Kali there in that picture, which is from Indra Kishore Mishra's Puja room. And what has that to do with the music that came out of there? So right away, I want to tell you that music is, the, the, when I say use the word place, it is about Betia. Betia is an extremely important place. At the same time, this is not only about Betia. When you composed in Betia, what was that place? So we'll unpack that. Then, so I'm going to bring in what I would call the regional, the local connections, the regional, the pan-regional, all the way to what I would call pan-Indian cosmologies. And this is something that I think all of us can relate to. So I must say that sitting in Chennai, the connection between Kriti, 
and places it's not uncommon take dikshitar take the tirupugal right take any of these forms kshetras and the connection to music is not new but i am trying to say something slightly different here and that is it is not just about the kshetra or that place which is a geographic location or even just the god in that place the notion of place itself when you compose in a place like betia was transformed and that is through the kinds of histories that i will share so it's a lot about circulation and the, what i want to close with after this experience of listening to this history and hearing the music in the context of its creation is it why is it important and why is it important especially in today's world so more this is uh, this is the vibrant betia raj and you'll see that it's a raj that started in the 16th century or even before that this is one of the uh, images that uh, as you walk in you'll see uh, of the estate is it reasonably visible okay yeah so the origins of the long lineage of continuous lineage of kings they started off as courtiers from the time of akbar and by the time of shah jahan uh, they were given a khilat to actually become a uh, a raj so the emperor gad singh and his name is important because not only did shah jahan you know make this a raj the malliks of betia they say that their families traveled from kurukshetra to the mogal court so they were actually musicians in shah jahan's court and from shah jahan's court they came along probably along with other things they migrated to betia so the early settlement of musicians is very connected with the patronage circuit and we know that this to be true of history that you know gifts just don't come is something just doesn't just land doesn't come by itself it comes with a whole lot of other things in this case fortunately drupad came along with the raj now um so if we started with the music there raja dilip singh's time see when you go to betia today one of the biggest presences aside from the estate and the temples is the church so you, the first building you'll see when you go to the to the main town in betia is a capuchin church and you can look this up it's one of the oldest capuchin missions in india so this was for was actually established during the time of raja dilip singh so the 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 other thing continuity right the raj gurus of betia played a very big role they are actually tantric priests and you see the connection to devi worship coming they migrated from gujarat and till today the raj guru family lives in a huge quarters right right adjacent to the palace palace grounds a part of the palace grounds and uh, they are ashtachop brahmins even today their women do not leave the house in betia so i went there i met them is very big house so it's not that you know that difficult to stay inside but i have to say that when they go to their mother's house in kota they do go out but when they are in betia the women are actually inside uh, the tantric priests had to, had a lot to do with how um, in with the culture of devi worship that became the dominant mode of creativity even in music so you've got the church on one side and you've got the temples on the other side i come to the story of the muslim musicians in a little while now this part of um, the the lineage is very important to us because you will see maharaja anand kishor singh and naval kishor singh so anywhere if you look up the betia gharana these were the composers who they say that before they brush their teeth they would compose five songs a day okay before they brush their teeth so i went to the essay i was very interested so where is this place where you know somebody is actually composing before they brush their teeth and you maybe my imagination but you see there is a there is a panchamukha linga that, that that has been in worship for a long time then there is a bhavani mantap 
the, there are many many locations in betia even if it is broken down and dilapidated which is how it is today you will see holes broken buildings everywhere but still the aura of the history is not left and it is the strength of the kinds of connections that were gathered into this betia that really funded musical creativity in early 19th century betia so and then i must mention that both those composers were the most famous ones and you will be hearing music from uh, the composed compositions from both of them rajendra kishore singh also composed he also sang harendra kishore singh was the last maharaja of betia by then the british presence was extremely strong this is an indigo grow, growing estate, estate right from the 16th century the east india company's presence has been very strong there uh, harendra kishore singh married twice but he had no issue and so uh, the the betia estate finally in the early 20th century in 1904 went into the hands of the court of wards the patronage that had lasted from the time of gad singh in the early 17th century all the way it got much more difficult you you hear about the famines you know it was not an easy place to live even in the 90 uh, late 19th century by then musicians started to leave whoever was left behind in betia in the early 20th century it was suffering for them and when you go to today to indra kishore mishra's house and you meet the other musicians there you realize that poverty has been a constant companion to their sounds yet he has not left many of them have left he didn't leave he still lives there fortunately some people left it to some extent and so that music traveled otherwise why would i a south indian born and brought up in chennai even be talking to you about this or having learned this music it is through its travels so just want to show you the bojpatra manuscript it's called the durga anand sagar uh, this you see a pada it's it's in rag godmalar uh, tal sulfakta and uh, this doesn't have any notation it has only the padas and this manuscript is in the possession of uh, pandit indra kishore mishra and a few other families in betia it's also torn tattered and kept in the loft it's not in sangeet natak academy or any other uh, you know not yet so a little more about 19th century betia there were five different traditions see the history of hindustani music you know that especially with khayal with also with drupal we mostly talk about lineages the word gharana even for people who don't listen to hindustani music it's a very common term we are mostly interested in who taught whom who how what was the family line what was the teaching line how did they transmit the style and that seems to be the end of the story but in a place like betia you cannot tell the story that way first of all it was a terrible shock to me to find out that who i thought my own guru who falguni pandit falguni mitra ji he is a carrier of the betia tradition then i go to betia and i find many other families there who also claim the same tradition they sing differently and then there is so there were three families of malliks the mishras of banaras and the ustads of kalpi aside from that there was maharajas anand kishore and navel kishore only two lineages survive today of that only two musicians have made it to a concert stage and are expert practitioners so this is pandit indra kishore mishra's lineage and uh, the photograph there is of his grandfather pandit shama malik the next one is pandit falguni mitra's lineage um and he it the betia uh, it, you see this circulation what is place here came from nepal came to betia went to banaras and now uh, pandit falguni mitra lives in bengal there was a migration circuit of patronage that enabled this flow of music and uh, pandit ji's uh, the origin point is karim sen who was in nepal court very interestingly you can trace karim sen right back to mia tansen the the extraordinary figure in so this work was actually done by historian catherine shofield 
where so pandit falguni mitra's lineage you it is actually a direct descent that you can trace to tansin and but it is not directly coming only th- from delhi and staying in delhi and you know coming through the senia line there was all that circulation that was implicated and the mishras of banaras were very important to this okay now let's get to, i've talked a lot about lineages and uh, that isn't really that is only is important to this but where how did this music happen where did it happen so now we come to the idea of place so what you see in front of you is the bhavani mandap um this by the way was uh, the photograph taken in 2006 um it's quite pretty there and you see the patch of grass the 19th century chronicles late 19th century chronicles of maharaja harinder krishor singh during navaratri on day 1 the maharaja used to write a diary every day he was after all trained by the british you know he had a you know he had a tutor and all that so he used to write his journal every morning he would get up do his sandhya vandan drink a glass of bale sharbat go and uh, do his pranams to his sister and during navratri every morning he would go to the bhavani mandap there would be a hereditary priest a, and that case it was a bhat there are also upadhyayas there that hereditary priest was standing there and then on day 1 of navratri one goat was sacrificed there was bali charan on that patch of grass you see there day number 2 2 goats day number 3 3 goats day number 9 you count now this is in the king's chronicles what the king does not mention when a goat is sacrificed a song is sung they sing a song called a khatka a khatka is a ritual drupad it cannot be sung when a goat sacrifice is not happening until pandit indir kishor's father was alive the musicians the, the maharajas would send carriages to their street you saw that street carriage would come pick up the musicians take them and they would sing when the bali charan was being ha- done both in the rajguru's residence and in the palace i i spoke to the rajguru i said and, and that day actually it was during i did not go out during uh, navratri right I, I, on especially on navami both me and my guru pandit nidesh kishor vishwa we stayed at home he gave up the practice of singing khatka he he doesn't believe in bali charan he will not go so he gave it up and will not that song you will never hear again it's there in his notebook so that is so that is how it is but if you didn't hear that now i am actually going to start with some music now from now let's stop i will start with bhavani dayani so this was recorded you will see a very familiar figure here uh shrimati ji narmada and some of us here are her classmates um uh, we uh, she actually accompanied pandit mishra in a, a, a prakriti foundation um, organized a festival in uh, 2010 and this is a rendering of bhavani dayani by pandit ji aap log is mandir ko lagbhag sadhi ko hi jaate honge bada bhairavi ki mandir hai lekin hai betiya maharaja ki rasta usko khayal mein log gaate ho jaate hain khair mujhe umeed hai ki wo mandir se aap sabhi ko maalum hone ka hai aur hoga Oh, oh, oh. 
was Pandit Indir Kishor Mishra uh, singing in spaces with uh, Srimati Ji Narmada on the violin and Sri Apurvalal Manna on the Pakavaj. Uh, Sri Apurvalal Manna passed away a few years ago but he has been a big part of uh, you know even the work and the, uh, the musical life of the Betia Garana. He has played a lot with these musicians, and sitting right next to um, Pandit Ji is his uh, second daughter Jaimala Mishra. She has accompanied him a lot on his concerts. Uh, at the moment, I think she is no longer singing, but um, from childhood these children have learnt at home. And she has actually travelled widely in India wherever he has performed. Oh, sorry. So we saw um, the Bhavani Mantap. The Bhavani Mantap was actually inside the palace grounds. There are other locations, and this is you see the Durga Bhag Mandir. And I uh, don't know architecture very well, but I believe that this is extremely special architecture. And uh, uh, this architecture again, so this idea of place, right? In Betia, the, the, the Tantric Drupad, the, the Tantra was practiced as religion. It was influenced the compositional style. It influenced the architecture and that was one of the things and also when they bring they used to bring mud so the miti from nepal they would bring mud from vindhyachal so even you know very physically what is place here so you are living in a rural town in west Champaran district of bihar but even today the people who are so isolated living there they feel connected to a much larger consciousness and that consciousness comes with these kinds of histories. Now I will play a short clip. This is a very beautiful composition again by uh, composed by Maharaja Anand Kishor Singh and uh, it is rendered by uh, Indra Kishor Ji and this happens to be in a specific Bani um, the Banis of Drupad are a uh, topic of their own. The Gaudha, they are aesthetic categories. So the Gaudar Bani is described as elephantine. It's a very slow pace. Uh, you will hear a lot of mead. 
so a lot of sweeping long sweeping uh, gestures so like jadu it is so those of you who listen uh, you know to i mean who who you hear this this one is a ativilambit very slow laya but slightly faster laya you will start to see the the structural uh, connections to dikshitrakritis it will come out but not in this one this is very very slow tempo and you see i put the words in front of you i play only the first part and uh, this is again a home recording mentions vindhyachal so you will know the vindhyachal is quite close to varanasi it is a big site of devi uh, worship so even when they write the the kritis the references for music that was sung in betia it references devi worship in the larger region region and there was also the bhats actually went from the deccan region to vindhyachal and then came to betia so right around even the priests there used to be a migration that way Salve. sorry so um now i will go on to one more gaudarvani composition uh the this i'm giving just a short clip here which is a video uh, i just like to uh, introduce the people in the video one is pandit falguni mitra and uh, he resided in madras for a very long time many of you here in the audience actually know him um, and you saw the lineage through which he is connected to to betia right and uh, with him uh, this was actually uh, part of the research that we were doing that i did and uh, this is shrimati meena banerji she is a very well known musicologist music writer musician herself and she writes regularly uh, in the hindu in the st- statesman uh, she wrote a very beautiful piece on uh, mahishasura mardani i think during navratri very recently also so uh, uh, meena banerji actually facilitated interviewing both pandit indrakeshwar mishra and pandit falguni mitra so here pandit ji will be demonstrating the gaudarbani drupal to meena ji and uh, then i will play a full rendering of the same drupad for you with accompaniment composition goes like this adha 
balance the upward glide with the downward glide. If you want to maintain the same amount of pressure, you see that there is a sa to sa sweep and then sa to sa coming down. And you can imagine that it is like the drawing the face. And so that uh, the amount of uh, just sheer um, breath control and a lot of this music is extremely demanding. The end result you can hear but to really hear what effort that goes into it and it is very very specific. So a song like this, you simply wouldn't change it when you render it. So that is the other thing, the compositions of Bethia, many of them, uh, they are more like works and especially the slow tempo ones. Faster tempo ones you do layakari, you do improvisation and do many other things. So this, uh, now I'll play a full recording of uh, Panditji's. Uh, which was, uh, uh, I think, recorded in 2006, again with uh, Sri Apurvalal Manna on the Pakavaj. And uh, the, the lyrics again are very beautiful. And uh, you will see that the uh, here too, you know, Durga, Kali, the Varnan of these, uh, these uh, deities is manifested through this music. And this too is a composition of uh, Maharaj Anand Kishor Singh. <laughs> Oh, uh -huh. 
complete composition in the Gaudar Bani. Um, as you can see, it takes a fair amount of time to sing. And uh, it's very rare to hear it in concerts. First of all, you don't hear that many concerts of the Betia Ganada musicians. And even when they sing, uh, if you, you know, it is very unusual to hear this composition in concert. So, I uh, set up this whole thing about the Balicharan. So, in uh, 
I want to give you, see, I, the katka, as, as I told you, uh, is not sung anymore. But there are other compositions in, um, uh, in the Khandarbani, which is a virras, you know, much more uh, robust kind of singing, where, uh, the, where uh, you know, you, you'll see that the next composition I play for you is to Kali. But before that, a short clip. Uh, uh, Panditji speaks in Hindi. Uh, I hope you can follow. If not, I will just quickly summarize after you hear him. So this is the interview with uh, Meena Banerjee, where uh, they he is talking to her about uh, this khatka. Devi ke charano mein jab bali di jati thi, us samay ke bhi kuch geet hai. देखा जाए इस प्रश्न का मैं आपको गाकर कोई जवाब नहीं दे सकता गाकर मैं कुछ भी नहीं बता सकता पर होते थे ऐसे गीत भी हुआ करते हाँ इसलिए कि एक बार मेरे पिताजी से किसी व्यक्ति ने हमारे गांव में एक रिश्तेदार ने पूछ लिया तो दुर्गा जी के बलि के समय में जो गाया जाता है उसको हमारी भाषा में कड़खा कहा जाता है क्या कहा कड़खा कड़खा वो बहुत डेंजरस सॉन्ग होता है बहुत खतरनाक गायक होती है वहाँ बलि प्रदान हो रही है बलि प्रदान हो रही है सामने खून छलक रहा है उस समय देवी को जगाने के लिए कड़खा गाया जाता है देवी को और ज्यादा जगाने के लिए तो वो कड़खा मेरे पिताजी से एक हमारे रिश्तेदार हैं वो गवा थे और गवाने के बाद रात में मेरे पिताजी सोए उसी समय दुर्गा जी वो काली वो तलवार है तो उनके गर्दन के ऊपर ऐसे करके खड़ी है काटने के लिए ये सत्य कथा है सत्य बात मेरे पिताजी बहुत जोर का चीज रहा है बहुत जोर मेरे दादाजी डोरे हुए क्या हुआ क्या हुआ क्या हुआ, क्या हुआ? तो मेरे पिताजी बोले कैसी ऐसी घटना है मेरे ऊपर ऐसे काली जी साक्षात काली और डबला लेकर और मेरे गर्दन पर काटने के लिए काली है मेरे दादा जी सोचने लगे क्या बात है ऐसा क्यों हुआ मेरे बेटा के साथ ऐसा क्यों हुआ मैं काली का भक्त हूँ मेरे दादा जी काली का भक्त मेरे बेटे के साथ काली माँ ऐसा क्यों की बहुत सोचने बात मेरे दादा जी ने पूछा कि एक चीज बताओ कि तुम भगवती जी कथा गाए हो कहीं पर तो हाँ बाबू जी हम कहा है तो कौन गवाया है तो फलाना गवाया बहुत पिटाई की मेरे पिताजी का दादा जी ने बहुत पिटाई किया मेरे पिताजी का खबर क्या जब बलि प्रदान होते रहे अच्छा। उस समय का खा जाने की चीज है अच्छा। वो बलि प्रदान के उस पर हमारे लिखा हुआ है उस पर ये अवसर पर गाने की चीज है अन्यथा नहीं गाया जाए मेरे कॉपी में लिख दिया हुआ सो यू गॉट दिफ्ट सो दे हैव रिचुअल ध्रुपद टूडे यू वुंट हियर ऑफ दिस ऑलमोस्ट एनी वेयर बट ध्रुपद actually has had a function in community it is classical music of the most complex form in hindustani music and uh, you know you can get every every amount of aesthetic uh, as an aesthetic form there's nothing lacking yet it has also been used in community when you go to a place like betia you realize that and the other thing is panditji will not sing it He, he, the, this is a stance that he says, no, it is never going to be sung again. It is written in my copy book. Do not sing it outside of the Balicharan context, because it is meant for Kali to get jor. And if she gets jor, when you do not sacrifice the goat, what is she going to do, right? So, Devi ke charano mein jab bali di jaati. So now um, I I'll play another song. It's a very beautiful song in uh, Raga Dana, and where you will you will see many of these same uh, themes being uh, uh, re repeated. So it will talk about Kali Kali. It will talk about the blood gushing, all that. But fortunately, this is not a Bali Pradhan song. Abhi aapne sorry. See, it is a very uh, it is a special rag. Um, the moment it's escaping me i'll tell you at the end uh, it ha it's not sung it, that rag itself is not used for other things so and uh, that form of the rag i've seen the notation um, 
there are couple there's an allied ragas there are some uh, ragas see at the moment this is what indra kishori tells us that this even the raga is not used in other contexts and that's possible because you know that ragas themselves they have function so they they sung for specific things in this particular raga as well as that bandish was meant for goat sacrifice sorry i think um, sometimes i'm not hearing your question in which case just feel free to ask even more you know loudly or just put your hand up or something abhi aapne kaha ki maharaj roz durga aur kali devi ki stuti mein koi rachna kiya karte the to hame koi rachna sunayi hai sunayi nahi aapko hai na राज अराना में अभी वर्तमान काल में राग अराना कोमल धीरे से गा रहा है गाया जा रहा है लेकिन प्राचीन काल में हमारे घराने के अंतर्गत और बहुत सारे घराने और भी हैं जहाँ कि शुद्ध धैवत से भी राग अराना गाया जाता था अराना में शुद्ध धैवत एक महाराज के पंडित न काली को काले कोपि खग सुलहिल सिंह चर काले कोपि खग सुलहिल सिंह चर बैठी असुर तन मलिन संगारो काले कोपि काले कोपि खग सुलहिल सिंह चर बैठी असुर तन मलिन संगारो काले कोपि रुंड कति और मुंडन मही रुंड कति और मुंडन मोरत सुनी कपियत जोरत सुनी कपिय रुंड कति और मुंडन में जोरत सुनी कपिय जोगिनी हसत सुर जय जय पुकारो काली कोपी काली कोपी काली को इस रचना के शब्द एक बार बता दे अलग से जी इस रचना के शब्द है काली कोपी खर्ग सिंह चढ़ी पैठी असुर डालन मलिन संघालो ये वीर रस वीर रस की रचना है जी हाँ जी वीर रस की रचना है और आपकी गायकी भी उसी के अनुसार जो वाणी है जी 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 है वो भी इसमें गायकी में खंडार वाणी की ये गायकी है और खंडार वाणी की गायकी भी रस में ही बताया जा रहा था सो बेसिकली द खंडार वाणी इज वेरी यू नो यू यूज द नावी सो मच ऑफ द गमक इज डन लाइक कपाल बाटी होगा सो द प्रैक्टिस फॉर दिस इज बेसिकली लाइक डूइंग कपाल बाटी एंड बट यू सी इट्स नॉट जस्ट अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ प्रोड्यूसिंग द गमक it is the setting of that kamak in the framework of the composition and that really produces the aesthetics so i come to the third site here a very special site this is uh, the kali bag mandir now the kali bag mandir was uh, built um, by raja dilip singh he was also i remember i told you about the kapuchin mission the kapuchin mission was founded during raja dilip singh's time now how did he what did he do it wasn't just some uh, a temple with one murti they have 144 murtis of kali in that place of devi and the devi from everywhere from vindhyachal from kashmir from hingala from the south so uh, 144 is the number i remember but a large number of devis all the murtis they are uh, settled around this water body and what about the water body you know what's the water there at that time raja dilip singh decided that many people could not leave betia it was you know extremely isolated even in those times and more so perhaps so he got the water from many sacred rivers ganges and many other rivers brought it to betia and filled the tank so again you see this assembly of place so the idea of 
a cosmological consciousness, a connection, a connection to devis all around. And uh, you will see, um, this is a very important site because you see also some compositions that invoke the devi in many places. And I'll play one for you uh, in the next slide. Oh no, I'm going to play for you something else first. Uh, this is a Khandarbani Bandish. Uh, and you can see that this is also a picture of the, uh, this is the Kalibag Mandir. And this is where now uh, most of the Murtis are uh, inside. And the podium. So this is a, uh, unusually in Rag Puriya. Those of us who listen to Hindustani music know that uh, Rag Puriya is a very, very, uh, sort of, it's a very serious Rag. Uh, somber and uh, you don't really expect very uh, robust uh, singing in that. You see the beautiful way in which this bandish is set. You know, the Khandar Bani, which is a vigorous, virus Bani, set uh, in a song, which is in a raga that typically you would not use, but beautifully set. And the uh, it is being rendered by Pandit Falguni Mitra. Khandar Bani is Rupert. Rag Puriya Tal Jap Tal Composer Maharaj Anand Kishore Singh of Bidu Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Kalibag Mandir, we are still there. Um, I'm just going to play, slow the pace down again, um, and play a Gaudar Bani Drupad in Rag Bhim Palas. Um, and here, uh, this will sort of reflect what I taught. Uh, we talked about this place, right? So, this particular Drupad, uh, I, I just play this Thai for you. Again, uh, a number of these recordings are home recordings. I have to apologize for some of the, uh, you know, the static and all that. <laughs> first part of the song. So already you saw, you know, Jwala Mukhi, Paschim Pahad, so in the east, in the mountains. Uh, Hingala, Hingala Devi, uh, she's actually in, in Pakistan. So you, you imagine that Kashmir Sharada, she will also come later on in the, in the song. And Dakshina Devi. So beautiful song, all four parts. It's like taking a tour. You, know, you don't need no travel tourism, you just sing the song, right? Um, and uh, so, but uh, here is this musician, the, the harmonium you heard in the background doesn't have proper bellows. So at that time, his, his stithi was uh, extremely difficult. He was having, facing a lot of problems. 
hopefully now with his children are older they have got some government jobs is in better shape now in terms of the money that doesn't mean in terms of music in fact it is even more arid than before there are fewer people who even call people to concerts or drupad itself of this kind uh, it is very difficult even find it anywhere but in that house in betia he was able to reproduce this sense of place and that it really is has been the goal of this talk to recreate that sense through shared listening okay so i think i'm done with 19th century betia so uh, another 15 minutes and then i'm going to stop you know just to in the interest of questions so like i told you pandit falguni mitra's lineage actually comes from niya tansen even uh, you know on paper it shows indra kishore ji's lineage also goes back to 17th century and from shah jahan's court aside from that the ustads of kalpi i mentioned them nobody they stopped singing kale khan ustad uh, 1930s was probably the last uh, ustad from that line after that they 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 were singing ghazals they were singing khayal zakir hussain saab he was uh, he was around in patna until the 1970s now none of them sing the other two malik lines also nobody sings but the origins of this tradition in the 19th century the seniyas you know you know aud the center of uh, lucknow uh, in the 18th century you know the, there was a lot of uh, Uh, unrest and the the nawab of aud also left and came to metia burj in kolkata just before that many of the musicians actually migrated out so first there was a migration from delhi when the imperial court uh, you know went into a, a decline then even from aud there was circulation so pyar khan saab and haider khan saab direct descendants of tansen full seniya parampara This is this is the biggest parampara, biggest tradition in Hindustani music is Tansen's lineage, right? And so they their bandishes, their compositions. So the tradition today has all those composers. And here, so now I will I will play. Uh, I'm going to play again. What were those uh, th- those composers uh, composing? Tansen, Sai, Tu Na Aave, Aaj. no on krishna uh, then uh, indra kishore ji sings uh, a song hara 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 mahadev also by tansen and uh, now i'm going to play you uh, in this first i play so i will leave devi now for the for the moment in her place and uh, shift to a few other deities and the point here being again that this pan indian nature if i wouldn't even would say pan indian it's a bit uh, it's at least pan regional pan local you know so you go around so there were circuits so both the connection with the kings the connection of the priests people were traveling many of them traveled the musicians traveled the practices traveled the mud traveled and so there was this kind of a culture built up around place with the music So this is a circulation map. Um, I like this map very much because it really tells you at a glance how uh, music in Betia took from Lucknow, from Nepal, from Varanasi, from Reva, from Tonk, from Jhansi also. So uh, the yellow lines were the, uh, Delhi uh, circulation into Betia, and then end of 19th century when the patronage waned, there was no money for anyone uh, except the Malik's. and the kalpi ustad who stayed and stopped singing uh, the mishras of banaras especially they moved out they went to betia and kolkata and it is from that lineage that much of the music has reached the public ears and so you this you know the, about the sangeet chandrika and the sangeet manjari these were famous musicians in the court of rabindranath tagore and shaurendra mohan tagore um, radhika prasad Go- Go- goswami uh gopeshwar ba- bandopadhyaya they were all they learned from the betia gharana musicians so the bishnupur baran gharana has a lot of connection with the betia uh, mishras so the betia mishras went to banaras and they went to kolkata 
and the repertoire therefore spread in that entire region. So I will play for you now um, uh, uh, again a Khandarvani Drupal in Rag Habir. It's uh, ba the composer is Buddha Prakash. <laughs> Many compositions uh, on Shiva, uh, they have the Veeras, also uh, other uh, Banis, uh, Gaudar, Dagur Bani, I didn't talk about the Banis too much today, but this especially, you can see the kind of gamaks, how beautifully they are set to uh, sort of bring out the Varnan of Shiva. This is a, a, a spontaneous recording. So, I told you that in the Betia court, uh, Pandit Falguni Mitra's lineage and Pandit Indakishwar Mishra's lineage, they probably were in the same place for about a hundred years. But then, at the end of the 19th century, the lineage uh, migrated out, the Mishras. So, after a hundred years, these musicians, they met in Kolkata and they spontaneously found a song that both of them knew. Their repertoires are very distinct from each other. They are not that much of commonality. So, then they just started to sing together. So, that moment, it's a very poor recording by me. So, please don't watch the camera. It's very disturbing. <laughs> So you see, they are working it out between them. It is very uh, fascinating. Each of them has learnt it slightly differently. So then, so one is saying room the other one is you know, saying the other way. And uh, Pandit Faguni Mitra actually did not know that the Digambar there is Indra Kishorji's great grandfather. So that so that has come down in Indra Kishorji's line as a composition of his ancestors. Whereas with Pandit Faguni Mitra, you know, Digambar was a composer, and so he has understood Digambar to be some uh, anonymous composer. So they have slightly different perspectives on this bandish and like all musicians you know that you know these are the things that actually uh, they hold very strongly by also. It is a very interesting meeting. Now uh, we have uh, we have somebody from uh, we have this is a recording done in Brihadwani and Sri Kumar is here. So it is actually done in uh, Dr. Karakudi Subramanian uh, institution. Uh, Pandit Mitra had come there. Um, and uh, there was a concert uh, and uh, so there I want to play this is son of Tansen and you see what he is composing to it is a beautiful Khandarvani uh, Drupal in Rag Bihar Surat Sen was uh, Tansen had four children Surat Sen was one of them <laughs> Then 
In this, I am taking up a composition in Japtal, 10 beats. The composer was Tan Senji's son, Surat Senji. <clears throat> again, I will say again, in this particular song, he is talking of Sri Ramchandra coming back to Ayodhya after being triumphant over Ravana, taking Sita back to Ayodhya. And uh, jubilation is there, celebration is there, that Raja Ramachandra has come back to Ayodhya. Mera dum da da la saaj da sharath suta ram Padam da sha kote te kote kope dhayo Mera dum da da la saaj da sharath suta ram this is a forceful one. Lagana Chahu Lagana Chahu I'm 
composition you could he is doing really layakari so first he sang the composition and then he did the layakari but the point uh, what i wanted to make here is even as far as far back surat sen must have been uh, living probably in the 17th century so late 16 no yeah 17th century being tan sen's son so uh, the, the kind of theme that he's picking up not just that it's trending today okay so but uh, that you know the, the idea that uh, rama is going back to uh, ayodhya with sita and uh, uh, and it, the composition just uh, takes on that uh, story and it makes it alive for us through the way the composition is set and uh, i'm going to close with uh, one last clip um again um this is a recording um done in varanasi uh in the shrimat and uh, uh, it was a in a in a not in the shrimat it was in a ganesh temple uh, on the uh, banks of the ganga and that is santosh mishra ji on the sarangi and apurvalal manna on the pakavaj and here pandit falguni mitra is singing a dhamar which is this allied uh, genre so drupad and dhamar go together dhamar is especially known for uh, the theme of color play it is uh, uh, commonly sung during in braj in the braj region there dhamars are said to many things but the theme of holi and color play is very common and the dhamar is also a tal so dhamar is a song form which is sung to dhamar tal and here um the song talks about um the play of colors during holi and it is set to a very uh, beautiful rag kafi ganga i just play for a couple of minutes <laughs>
there um, just to reiterate the themes um, the kind of listening experience that I wanted to share with you is really to hear the music with all its entanglements. See, you can, you know, you, today everything is out there on YouTube or it's available on some digital media. Even where all these clips available, first of all, almost nothing is available on YouTube. And I have actually not put my, even the clips I have made during my research out because this is not music that's very commonly heard today. And how would you hear it? How would you understand it? So that has really been the thing that I am grappling with. And I very much like to get ideas from, you know, those of you, you who are here today. How, if I were to just put these clips out on YouTube, somebody, you know, you randomly go click on it, find something, listen. How would you get the sense of the music? And for music such as this, for most of our music, context really matters. And so what I, uh, you know, as part of my own work, I've been really deeply sort of thinking about it is how to make the practice of listening, especially in the digital age, much more contextual. Because I do believe that it's really important. You know, the, the bots can always get at this. You know, they can serve you your preferences based on whatever algorithms they have. Which bot is going to understand this? You know, or if we've got to make the bots understand it, you've got to make this data available. So that is really uh, what I wanted to share with you today. This idea of place as a gathering of experience, a gathering of experience that gives rise to creativity, a gathering of experience that enables a kind of listening, and finally, how listening reanimates our experience of things. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you very much. And thank you especially for, for all of you for coming and for the opportunity to speak. There are some people missing in the acknowledgments. It's always the last slide. You, you should be the first slide I put. I didn't put India Foundation for the Arts, the Fulbright Commission, my own University of Berkeley and the Ministry of Culture who all funded a lot of the work that was done. Uh, and the families, the friends, the peers, the students, most of all the musicians and the scholars who worked. Thank you. You're welcome to stay and speak. I know it's close to... What is the language? What is the language yeah. spoken there in Bethia? In uh, Bethia, it's Bhojpuri. Bhojpuri. Yeah. The compositions themselves tend to be in Brajbhasha. There are, there, are, there are also compositions in Sanskrit, in Audi. There is also some mix of uh, Persian, Urdu words. Some compositions definitely have Urdu, but uh, predominantly is Brajbhasha. Uh, I have a yeah. any female singer. Is there any female singer available there? Female singers, did you say? It's a very good question. Drupad in general has not had that many uh, women singing, uh, but this particular tradition, uh, when the when the musicians went to uh, to Calcutta, there Jadu Mani, her name is I have not heard. These are people whose recordings are not available. There are, there are though, few names available of people who sang Drupad. But more interestingly, the most famous musicians of Banaras, Siddheshwari Devi, Rasulan Bai, they were all musicians who were trained in Drupad by Jaikaran Mishra ji's uh, son-in-law, Bade Ramdas ji. Bade Ramdas ji was one of the most famous musicians in Banaras. He was a Betiya Gharana trained musician, he learned Drupad from his own father-in-law and from also other people, he's learned Khayal. But Siddheshwari Bai, many of Rasulan Bai, Bari Moti Bai, they, were, they all sang Drupad and they learned Drupad and then they became famous Thubri singers. So the Drupad has come, in the, the Chau, they're called Chaumaki Kalakars or people who sang four different kinds of genres. 
But yes, we are still waiting. Are there any documentaries made? So this is this looks sounds perfect for a documentary. Like many documentaries. We really should be making this documentary. And no, I mean, I uh, these are all the things that I should have done in the last ten years. Uh, I have a. I call I call it a documentation DVD. I'm such a pure videographer, but it. And the unfortunate thing is, so many people have died in the process. I couldn't share some very, very moving clips with you. I went to this uh, village called Gobardhana, uh, where Shankar Lal Mishra was the uncle of Indra Kishore Mishra. He was in a hut. He was all but he was paralyzed, lying down, not able to move. Nothing. His two sons sang in front of him. They sang a Khandarvani. It was actually was, uh, in Rag Shankara. It was a stuti that has been tuned by them, and this gentleman was just lying down. He there were flies on his. He was in a hut. There were flies on his uh, forehead, and as they sang, slowly he started moving his hands. It really was a most moving moment that I've had on the field in that sense. That music is so deeply ingrained, and during the course of my work. Uh, Raj Kishore Mishra ji died. Shankar Lal ji Mishra ji died. Two big patrons, Gajendra Narayan Singh. Without him, Indra Kishore Mishra ji would not have seen the light of day outside. Bihar Sangeet Natak Academy, and he wrote about the Betiya Gharana. He died. Rai Anand Krishna, the patron in Banaras of Jayakaran Mishra and all those musicians, their their family founded the Bharat Kala Bhavan. He died. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so I mean it's. Uh, th this is work that was urgent 30 years ago, uh, and at some level, you know, if somebody wants to join me to do the work, I am really looking for help. So please reach out. See, this Bali challenge must uh, must be happening uh, every year, right? Uh, so somebody must have recorded the actual Katarnath Bandish. Mm -hmm. See, the, it stopped. Uh, Indra Kishore Ji's father, probably the 1960s. That is when he was singing. He died in 1989 or something like that. By then, he he died of poverty, literally. But until then, he used to go. I don't know if they record. It's possible. I found recordings of Rajkish or Mishra and in and Mahant Mishra in uh, an IAS officer's house in Patna. And these were the people. Actually, the IAS officers are the ones. The police officers. They may be the ones because they were the patrons. The district collector there is called Maharaj. Who is there to? So then they used to call these musicians home, and I took the recording back to Indra Kishore Ji. He wept. He had not heard his father's voice for a few decades. This is a very common field work story, by the way. When you go and work with, uh, you know, communities that have undergone this kind of extreme endangerment, endangerment, often you are in the position of taking something back to them of what. Really should have thrived there. So I have just those two recordings, nothing from the past, and one recording, Kashi Sangeet Samaj, of this lovely music of Somnath Bhave, I think that that is his name, uh, singing a dhamar, and the the issue. The, so you can see the connection to how Falguni Ji does Layakari. It's not absolutely the same, of course, but that idea of taking the whole line of the bandish is very different from other traditions. For them, the words they supply syllables for improvisation. For the Bethi Agarana, it's text. You cannot. You have to keep the meaning intact. So when you improvise, that layakari is done in such a way that the song text is preserved. And that I found one uh, one soul recording in Kashi Sangeet Samaj. But the highest officers, I think, are probably likely to. If anybody is recorded, it will be the. The people who went to Bethia after the Raj. I thank Dr. Sumitra Rangada for her excellent lecture. Actually, it is a mini Hindustani music performance. Only thing we missed is her her own. I was told that she is a very good Hindustani singer. We missed. Somebody asked a question: What about women? She she could have recorded her voice and given us a small clip. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, next month, April 28th, at 10 o'clock, we have got Mr. Morgan Santanam talking lectum about 
कॉम्पोजिशन ऑफ कोटेश्वर अयर थैंक यू